Good to go? All right, cool. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Kedar Pavdi. I am the National Capital Region Director at the National Security Innovation Network. Uh, it is good to have you all here this morning. Uh, welcome, and I uh, hope you all got your first cup of coffee for what is to be an awesome, awesome panel. I got two rock star panelists here with me uh, to discuss the current and future state of trusted autonomy. On my right here is Dr. Jarrett Riddick, the Principal Director for Autonomy in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. And on my left here, I got Ms. Lauren Badula, uh, the Managing Director of the National Security Practice at Beacon Global Strategies. So I'll have each of my panelists uh, quickly give a little bit of background on themselves. Yeah, well, thanks, Kedar, and uh, thanks to Defense Scoop for uh, having, having me out this morning, and, and to Lauren for, for joining us. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, so about a year ago, I started the position I'm in now as the Principal Director uh, for Autonomy in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Came to this job from Army Research Laboratory, uh, where I spent the, the bulk of my career, um, PhD researcher, um, uh, uh, many roles in the laboratory. My last role was uh, Director of Strategic Initiatives. And, um, you know, uh, enjoying the ride uh, for a year, I've been engaged in a wire to wire campaign around trusted autonomy. So I'm looking forward to talking about that today. And thanks for having me. Thanks. And hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Badula. I'm so excited to be here this morning and also want to say thank you to Defense Scoop and the National Security Innovation Network for convening our panel this morning. As Kedar mentioned, I'm Managing Director at Beacon Global Strategies, where I lead our national security technology practice, which is really focused on working with tech companies that are passionate about supporting the national security community. I am also really involved with the investment space in defense. So I'm on the executive board of the Silicon Valley Defense Group, where I work with a lot of venture capitalists who are scoping technologies to invest in to enable national security and defense applications. I also do a lot with business executives for national security, BENS, where I chair their tech and innovation council and am currently working on a project looking at the necessities of the future industrial base to keep up with the national security threat landscape. So very excited to be here today. Awesome. So today's uh, main topic here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is trusted autonomy. Uh, Dr. Riddick, I want to start with you. You've been leading the operational uh, trust and mission autonomy initiative for the past uh, like several months, almost a year now. Uh, can you tell the audience what it is, what inspired it, and uh, you know what's going on with it right now? Yeah, yeah. You know, I also want to thank Ensign. I, I don't want to leave that out. Ensign has been a great partner um, in all the things that I'm doing. So, as I said, I started this position about a year ago, and uh, when I came into this position, um, I, you know, about two weeks into the job, I had an opportunity to brief the undersecretary. And going into that, you know, my boss said to me, my boss is the deputy CTO for critical technologies up in holiday. And he said, when you go here, you're going to have to have something to talk to you about trust autonomy. And, you know, I've been um, in, in the space for a while. I was the director of the vehicle technology director at um, research laboratory. And in that, in that role, I was overseeing basically an early applied research for all the physical autonomy, science and technology for the army. And I can attest to the fact uh, that you know, trusted autonomy was not a tremendous focus uh, in, in the things that we were doing there. It's more around uh, the hard problems in autonomy, perception, um, developing intelligence, mobility, navigation, et cetera. Um, and, you know, so, so going there, I knew, though, that there was a significant effort within the test and evaluation community around trusted autonomy. In fact, you know, in the research space, the trusted autonomy question has been really relegated to test and evaluation uh, until now. And so in this conversation with the undersecretary, it was very clear to me that her focus for trust and autonomy was beyond sort of the subject, subjective or trust as an emotion. It was some people have said to me, well, we'll, we'll train it until we trust it. Uh, what she's really, you know, from my perspective, interested in is trust as a product um, that is a quantifiable battlefield asset um, for effective human machine teaming. But also, you know, that we can understand at the enterprise level where decision makers are making decisions about deploying autonomy, um, that they have the, the, the right input uh, to be ordered to deploy the autonomy fully and effectively. So what I've done with this initiative that I call Optima or Operational Trust and Mission Autonomy is really focused on trust in the operational sense. And so we wanna be able to um, deliver um, you know, trusted performance, trusted behavior, trusted autonomy uh, in complex contested environments on the multi-domain battlefield in the future 
that really enhances human machine team to make it effective. And so, so this is looking not simply at you know trust with large, but really in the operational sense, complex contested environments and specific to missions. Got it. So, you know, from this initiative, uh, what have been the main lines of effort over the past, you know, six, seven months? Uh, what have you accomplished in that time? And uh, where do you sort of hope to go right now? Well, it, it's been 12 months. 12 months. <laughs> I, I mean, I say it's really been wire to wire because, you know, two weeks in, I had this uh, sort of very powerful meeting and it really focused up uh, what we're doing here. And so it, what I immediately did was I went to the VOD research community and, you know, this is where I came from. I said, hey, you know, what do we have? And, 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 and I found out from there, you know, mostly relegated to test and evaluation, but the other, the ranges of technology where we're looking at you know, other aspects beyond test and evaluation, we're not fully engaged. And so from there, you know, I, I had some subsequent conversations with folks that said, hey, you should talk to industry because industry is making a, a huge investment in t and &E and BNB of autonomy. And there are probably some things there. And so I did that and I, I really focused on our small and mid, mid, medium-sized businesses where we really, really have a lot, a lot of innovation. Of course, also talking to some of the bigger primes who are really um, have been leaders in the defense space forever. And what I noticed was every autonomy company that I went to pretty much said, hey, let us introduce you to our trust expert. Right? So they had trust experts. They had been thinking about this. Uh, there was a leader of an um, innovation laboratory at one of the big primes that I also talked to who said years ago, they had had a meeting internal to the company where they determined that trust was going to be a distinguisher for them in the space of autonomy. And they've been working this for five or six years. So there were lots of folks in industry who were focused on trust. And so it gave me a lot of, 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 of leads and people to talk to. And what I found out is that there is a community of folks out there who've been working in this space around trust and trusted autonomy um, without sort of being joined as a community. Uh, so sort of separate silos of, of people working together. So, so one of the things that I've done at Optima is to begin to gather folks and galvanize communities um, around this huge defense objective of having trust on time uh, so that we'll be able to leverage that community going forward. So I'm glad you mentioned industry. And on that, uh, Lauren, I actually want to pick on you here for a second. The, you mentioned you know, all the work that you're doing both with industry and on the investment community. So what have you been hearing on uh, you know the uh, autonomy space, the trusted autonomy space from you know the folks that you work with, uh, both inside the industry and then I guess in the more of the VC side. Thanks, Kader and Dr. Reddick. It's interesting to hear you talk about the past five to six years because I think that actually been such a pivotal time as you think about trust and autonomy. When we look at 2018 and Project Maven, and we had Google employees who are quite uncomfortable. Uh, with doing business at the time with DOD because there wasn't that transparency about what exactly is this program doing, what are we enabling, what are we teaming up um, to accomplish here. And I think DOD has done a great job since defining ethics and principles around AI, broadly speaking, which helps the private sector understand exactly um, what DOD wants to leverage these technologies for, which helps with adoption, but also development in direction in terms of what are applications we can leverage this tech for? How can product teams be thinking about development in a way that supports the defense community? And then I think also in terms of adoption over the past five years, we've seen an increase in companies that are actually extremely interested in supporting the Department of Defense and are working to navigate the acquisition processes to be able to do business. And so guidance in terms of trust requirements around security, I think are very important and, and creating that awareness so that developers can think through as they're building these technologies, baking security in from the start, but also reliability because adoption is so key from a business perspective to be successful. It's a, a difficult process to navigate doing business with DOD, but if you do it right, you can have great opportunities. And so part of that is getting guidance and, and requirements right early on and having that awareness around compliance and the acquisition process. And so I think that there's just this increasing appetite from the private sector to support defense and national security and adoption is key for them to be successful because they have to think about economic factors too. And so trust helps with warfighter use of technology um, and it goes both ways too. It's that transparency and dialogue, I think, between the two communities to talk about 
what are we building these technologies for? Mm -hmm. What do we want to support? What are DOD priorities in that sense? And so I think Dr. Riddick, your, your efforts have been so helpful from a private sector perspective as well. And it's not limited to just defense either. When we think about, say, critical infrastructure across the board, trust is so key. We want to know that these technologies are working. To be able to actually incorporate them into our day-to-day -day processes, we need to be able to team up with them as if they're humans too. So when we talk about human machine teaming, trust is such a key factor there. So Lauren, I want to pull a thread that you uh, on something you just said. Uh, you mentioned that you know getting you know clear requirements, clear almost a demand signal on the government side is uh, something that the private sector is especially craving. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Riddick, on that note, you know from the folks that you've talked to on the government side in this space, you know what what do you see as like potential demand signals? What do you think? Uh, you know, the government is signaling for, you know, future for the private sector to do on the trust and trust in time space. Yeah, you know, I think any strategic document that you look at, you know, you'll come away from the strategic document with the notion that um, DOD um, has accepted the fact that autonomous systems will be ubiquitous on the battlefield in the future. Um, you know, for me, when we think about that, you know, and, and I talk about, I always say the slogan, trust as a product, that is a quantifiable battlefield asset, right? This is about the warfighter. You know? And I talk to people all the time about which warfighter I'm talking about. Right? We're talking about a future warfighter, um, in some cases that has not been born yet, right? that'll be on a battlefield in the future somewhere that we can hardly imagine, very lethal battlefield against a very capable near peer adversary. And in those situations, um, that warfighter, man or woman, not yet born, will depend on the technology that we're developing now to defeat that adversary, to fight, win, and come home safe, right? And so this, for me, sort of crystallizes the problem, what this is about. So if we're doing technology development now that will not be fully adopted on that future battlefield to keep that warfighter safe, to give that warfighter uh, to overmatch in, in, in the battle, then all of the investment that we're making now is phenomenal, right? And so in that sense, really uh, advancing what we're doing in terms of trust will take the investment that we're making now in technological development and actually deliver it effectively on the battlefield. So it's about this investment that we're making that we're asking you know, industry to make, how will it be effectively deployed on the battlefield fully to fully realize that investment? Um, and, and this, you know, again, I bring the focus back to the world, right? And this notion of, you know, trust as a product, right? That is a, a battlefield asset, a quantifiable battlefield asset. And so, in the in the in the, the conversations that I've been having and, and sort of developing the path forward for the objectives of the Optima Initiative, I have seized on quantifiable metrics as a place to focus. Um, you know, I have upset a lot of neuroscientists <laughs> talking about trust in the way that I do. Um, but I'm an engineer, right? And I think about the problem in an engineering sense. And so there is absolutely a sort of scientific approach to thinking about trust and, and mental models and mapping the brain, et cetera. But on the engineering side, if we look at it from a mission perspective, I have a mission objective. And to get to this mission objective, I know what conditions will be most favorable, what operational effectiveness looks like. And so if I take the operational effectiveness and I look at it through a lens of, of, of what impact trust will have, I can characterize what are those parameters, right, that, that constitute an engineering state of trust. And those quantifiable metrics then become very important to uh, determining that. Quantifiable metrics then become a proxy for a lot of things. I'm not measuring trust. I'm measuring these quantifiable metrics that I have decided to determine the state of trust. And I can use those quantifiable metrics to design systems. I can use those to design, uh, you know, the mission plan, the force structure around quantifiable metrics, but I can also use those quantifiable metrics to design processes, right? To determine operational effectiveness of a, of a system for a, a PM or PEO, right? And so those quantifiable metrics then also can become ways that I talk about the requirements. And so in the Optima initiative, the goal really is to build frameworks within the acquisition lifecycle that help uh, PMs and PEOs who are buying technology to ensure that they're buying trust in autonomy, right? That they're buying trust as a product along with the autonomy. And so in that, 
you know, the quantifiable metrics become a guider, a, a guide, and they also really present commercial opportunity because now we're saying to a commercial vendor, really, if you, in a, for a certain system, for a certain mission, can come in with those quantifiable metrics to show how they impact operational effectiveness, this becomes a value proposition versus a mandate, right? I've never wanted to be in a position of mandating to people, you must do this, right? I want to offer a, an opportunity for industry partners and for developers to come in with, uh, you know, with these types of metrics that give uh, a, a measure of operational effectiveness that the PM can then use to determine uh, you know, goals for their program. So to build on that for a second, and Dr. Riddick, you mentioned, you know, specifically metrics for operational effectiveness used by, you know, the PEOs, the PMs of, you know, each of the services. Some of the metrics inherently are going to be more driven toward, uh, you know, the operational effectiveness on the battlefield, which necessarily may not have a clear dual use um, mm -hmm. parallel. Mm -hmm. So, Lauren, I guess the question for you then is, you know, from the conversations you've had, uh, what is the appetite for uh, you know smaller businesses, the VC community to look at more almost like defense specific uh, technologies that may not necessarily have a dual use application, but like are in that squishy middle where they can potentially be adapted, but maybe sit more on the defense side than the commercial side. Mm -hmm. Well, and one point I just want to echo that I'm so glad to hear Dr. Riddick talk about, which I think Kadar is important to your question, is this idea of value proposition versus mandate. Too. So it's more providing guidance in terms of the art of the possible and thinking about this in a way where we're mitigating risk, but not limiting the potential of these technologies or the pace at which we're developing them, which is so important from an economic perspective, but from a, a threat perspective too, when we think about keeping pace with our adversaries. And so Kadar, your question is about dual use companies or those that may not be as closely connected as the way we think about applications on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And I think the conflict in Ukraine has been a great example of the many technologies that are applicable on the battlefield. When we think about satellite imagery and the companies that have really stepped up, when you're watching CNN, you see Maxar imagery publicly available, um, reporting in real time what's happening on the ground. Or small UAS is another great example, especially when we're thinking about trusted aut autonomy, um, what we can enable by sending in these small uh, UAS, UAVs to whether it's get better insight on the ground or think about force protection as Dr. Riddick was talking about earlier. And so I think that there is less disconnect, certainly when we talk about near pair competition versus say counterterrorism when it comes to dual use technologies. But this dialogue and transparency is so important back to informing product development so that they aren't incredibly disconnected when it comes to these applications for war fighters. So I think it's really important to have these continuous conversations so that the software developers, engineers, the real kind of tech experts are thinking about those applications so that we can quickly pivot and don't need to spend years tailoring uh, to defense specific applications. And then Dr. Riddick also talked about, we have these small and medium disruptors or non-traditionals but partnering with primes and partnering with the more traditional defense industrial base, I think is really important. And that's something that I'm certainly seeing more of today than I was five years ago when we talked about sort of that project maven timeframe, which by the way, is really interesting because Google now is rolling out a massive national security business mm -hmm. and is really dedicated to the defense work. So again, just that transition in five years, but to see the small players team up with the more traditional industry players, I think is really important to offer ultimately what the warfighter needs as quickly as possible too. So I'd say partnerships, but also guidance from DOD is really important to kind of connect the dots between commercial technology and DOD applications. And I think, uh, Lauren, you mentioned the word partnerships, and Dr. Riddick, you've been working very, very extensively on the partnerships bit, especially. Uh, you know, what sort of partnerships have you been, you know, using, you know, through your the last year or so, or building, I'm sorry to say, um, with you know different partners, especially on the Occam initiative? Yeah, um, you know. Um, I've been very keen on the fact that Optima is an initiative and not a program or a product. And I, I chose that word very intentionally. Um, so you think about um, the, the world I come from, Future Vertical Lift started as a DOD initiative. And from there, you then had an Army Science and Technology Program joint, 
joint multi role technology demonstrator. Then the Army um, stood up a modernization priority and future goals to look. From that, we got the cross functional teams. And now you have programs of record spawning the family of systems for FDM, right? So, so the word initiative, when I think of it, you know, is, is broad based and it looks to the long term, right? Um, so um, I have, of course, engaged across DOD, um, other government agencies as much as possible. Recently, with INSEN, I had an incredible meeting at Purdue uh, with partners there in the ICON Center, that's where I met Lauren. Um, over 120 participants there from academia, DOD, and venture capital community, right? Um, the, the industry uh, engagement, I think, is really important. I'll come back to that in a second. Also, have been engaging with the intelligence community, right? Because as we think about where we're going um, in these areas, it's really under, uh, important to understand the, the threat picture and to understand that to be sure that we're bringing forth some robust solutions in these spaces. Um, so so there, there's been uh, a range, right, of partnerships. And that's why I say it's been a wire to wire campaign because there has not been a dull moment uh, because there's so many um, partners to engage. And in those engagements, I'm really looking for um, the, the folks in those communities who've been working in this space. Lauren makes a really good point about, you know, I tend to look at those innovators because I'm really, really looking for uh, sort of where we're going next. Um, but, you know, as I said, historically, the primes have, have carried the, the ball, you know, for all of these, these types of technologies. And so it is that, that, that combination, really, that will help us accelerate um, towards transition and really focus on ways to accelerate the technology to the warfighter um, are, are critically important. The other point I think came up about dual use, right? And, you know, when you look at what DOD has done in terms of the, the policies that have been signed out recently by the Deputy Secretary of Defense on ethical AI, on responsible AI, I really think that that discussion is where we start to um, delve into the dual use of these things, right? So I definitely have a very focused picture on what I want you know, trust to do for the warfighter in context um, uh, complex environments. Um, but when we just take a step back, right, and look at ethical AI, responsible AI, all of the things that I'm doing nest within that, right? And that really is an international conversation, frankly, about where we're going with these technologies. And so within the, the conversation around eth ethics and responsibility, um, I think we find a lot of sort of the, the dual, the, the foundations for dual use nature of the technologies that we use on the battlefield for the world. So on that, I mean, on the topic of both dual use and partnerships, really, um, Lauren, the, what I'm curious about from uh, hearing from you is the, what, what sort of hurdles are you seeing? And I know we've, there's been a lot of discussion on, you know, working with the government and how difficult it is, but what other, you know, sort of like, uh, that barriers are, are you hearing that may not have been previously covered before? Like, or what other, like, what, what sort of, uh, what more can you add to that? Yeah, it's funny. I'm going back to this kind of five year span where there's been this increasing interest in participating in defense opportunities, teaming up. And I think it's really been accelerated, accelerated again by the conflict in Ukraine, where tech companies had a presence in Ukraine or can relate more to what's going on the ground or it has been so eye-opening to see and, and therefore wanting to step up companies like Airbnb um, and, and many others who are offering support and assistance however they can. So back to the dual use questions and hurdles, I think over these past five years, there have been great efforts to leverage rapid acquisition options like SIBRs and OTAs and opportunities to fail fast, which there has been such pressure on the department to do, try out these technologies, get them in a sandbox, see how they work, which has been great for companies to get a foot in the door. But that's when the, the hard part starts, in my opinion, because those efforts seem to be quite disconnected from ultimately user communities when it comes to supporting the warfighter or opportunities to scale, which I understand why efforts like Optima are so challenging to have an enterprise approach for, and I think you're doing a fantastic job um, to do, but when you have these one-off programs, sometimes companies or investors think, oh great, this means we have a long-term business opportunity within the Department of Defense, 
when it can be quite confusing or maybe misleading when that cyber phase one or two dries up and you don't have a program office to work with or a user community to ultimately scale. And sometimes that's on industry's part because it takes a lot of legwork to create awareness around what you're doing, build those relationships and show success. So it's really important for companies to invest in that process. But I think we need to uh, strengthen outlets for that value of depth we always talk about. So whether it's that short-term funding or guidance to companies or acquisition officials about how to keep the work going. And on the flip side, when we talk about partnerships, the reason I think they're so key, especially in autonomy, a lot of these software companies are providing ornaments on the Christmas tree. So it's one piece of ultimately what DOD would want as a solution. And so how can industry team up more effectively so they're offering that out of the box solution where especially software is integrated into some of the hardware components necessary for DOD to operationalize. And so I think even guidance from DOD in terms of what they want for that full package helps inform partnerships on the industry side so that teams can come together instead of depend on DOD to connect the dots between all of these technologies, which I think has been part of the problem with some efforts around AI adoption so far too. If you have one slice of computer vision that you wanna fit into the kill chain, what does that look like? And how can companies come together in a way where they're providing that? That's so why I think times are important and also DOD. Um, insight in that sense. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Curious as to what you think about that. Yeah, so, you know, so Lauren, I mean, um, what you're speaking to there really, you know, fits into what we're doing with Optima. I think you, you, you know, sort of said that. So, so what we really uh, have structured in, in the initiative going forward really is a way to, we will use pilots and proofs of concept, mm -hmm. but use those to create some research baselines off of which we can build frameworks and document those frameworks in you know, DOD documentation, DOD instructions. Um, and those frameworks really uh, provide the guidance in the acquisition lifecycle for how, as we buy autonomy, we ensure that we're buying trust along with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's all based on you know, having quantifiable metrics for trust to connect to operational effectiveness, mm -hmm. right? And so those quantifiable metrics really become a commercial opportunity. Right? Mm -hmm. Because while the prime may own the, the the system or the system of systems, there should be opportunities uh, within the the guidance that was co constructed for even small businesses to come in and say, for this specific system in this specific mission, here are your quantifiable metrics of trust that you can use to make judgments about operation effectiveness um, um, for for systems going forward. So there's built in commercial opportunity if you lay out, you know, the, the, the sort of steps to get in there from, you know, technology development into frameworks that, that, that an acquisition lifecycle. And once you have those types of frameworks and instructions for PMs and PEOs, then they can reach to the research community and say, here are the things we need, right? Mm -hmm. So it creates sort of that connection across the bridge, bridge uh, the, the valley of depth that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I point to, um, you know, I, th I think we talked a bit about some of where these opportunities are, partnerships, et cetera. So sort of the roadmap that we've constructed for what we want to do in terms of trusted autonomy from, from the optimal perspective is thinking about in the near term, using things like assurance cases, which you know there's a lot of uh, work in industry around assurance cases and using those very structured sorts of questions to say within this sort of structured you know, case, this technology is trustworthy enough, enough to deploy. So that assurance case is a near term thing. And there are many um, uh, sort of corporate partners who have that experience. But as we move out from that, you know, you're thinking, you know, three to five years down the road, the test and evaluation community is going to really start coming forward with extraordinary applications and tools. And so what my engagement to that community has been is to say, can you start to do some discovery and validation around quantifiable metrics? Right? As long as, along with the tools that you're developing, can you also develop uh, some of these um, sort of guidance to folks that how do you get to quantifiable metrics? How do you get there? And I think that uh, with the uh, plethora, really, of um, experimentation venues that are popping up, whether it's project convergence or uh, the things we're doing at Raider, 
there will be many opportunities of experimentation, including humans, where you know the, the responsibility is on me really to go to these live constructive testing uh, um, sorts of uh, venues and say, hey, collect on these things because we need information back about uh, what some of these quantifiable metrics look like. Some of this can also be done in simulation, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have live constructed testing where we have actual tests with actual humans, uh, but we also have simulation where we can uh, sort of do some of this discovery and validation as well. And then characteristically, you know, what we're talking about in terms of systems being able to, you know, give us this capability around trust that we're looking for in Optimum is systems that have, you know, continuous monitoring, uh, sort of capability to do real-time performance assessment um, and using quantifiable metrics to do that, to always give us a, a, a picture of what the state of trust looks like within a system or an operation. So these notions of continuous monitoring and, 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 and being able to measure these quantifiable metrics sort of give us a guide to what are some of the things that we would love for industry to do, right? One, you know, obviously if we're talking about metrics, how do we measure these things? How do we track them, right? What are the technologies that we're working with in the industry that would give us a capability to do that? Many have said to me, well, if you're gonna do continuous monitoring and tracking, you're gonna slow down the autonomy. Um, I push back on that a bit, right? Because what we've seen, for example, Tesla doing with shadow mode AI, we know that they have an entire AI running in the background for development versus the one that the core AI that's running, running, running your car, right? And so why can't we have a, a, a shadow AI in the background that is a trust architecture, right? Where we endow that, um, that layer of intelligence with applications, tools, um, to you know, uh, make decisions around the quantifiable metrics that 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 part of the architecture is responsible for this piece that we consider trust or trust our time. Uh, so companies that would bring forth new architectures that would incorporate uh, quantifiable metrics or trust into the architecture into the machine intelligence. Now we're talking about you know design of the architecture in a completely different way where we can build in ethical and responsible behavior into the design of the machine intelligence, right? So these become research challenges, but also commercial opportunities. Well, Dr. Irving, to follow up on something you said here, you mentioned assurance cases. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned, uh, you know, leveraging a lot of the industry experience um, on assurance cases. And a lot of that experience has been honed in the autonomous vehicle spaces you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. For defense applications, how do you, you know, develop an assurance case? And I guess, how would you port that knowledge, so to speak, to industry, especially some of these non-traditionals that are trying to break in? Yeah, so, so I've been talking a lot to um, some of the companies that have some of this experience. One, I, I think it's okay for me, this is not an endorsement, uh, but there's a company in Pittsburgh, Edge Case Research. Um, they've done a lot of work around assurance cases um, for the automotive industry, using it for safety certification, right? And I believe that the work that companies like, like them are doing really creates analogs, right? And so it would be, using these not for safety certification, but for um, you know, autonomy assurance that really is over the life of the system, right? So we don't want to approach what we're doing around trust autonomy as simply a certification, something where we check the box once in the life of the system and it goes off. It really has to be uh, across the life of the system. And the Defense Science Board told us that in 2015, 2016. The Air Force Scientific Advisory Board told us that again in 2020. So it's really a lifelong uh, um, sort of approach. And, you know, when you think about where we are, though, realistically, you know, we're going to start with um, uncrewed systems that are totally operating, right? We won't start with even, you know, semi autonomous, frankly, they will, they will be totally operating systems. And so, in those cases, right, where we, we know how the system will be used, we know the mission we want it to perform, we are controlling it with a, with a human in the loop. Um, you know, assurance cases give us a lot of, of I think, uh, experience as to how to uh, deal with something like that. As we evolve out of those into systems that have more and more autonomy, more and more uh, freedom in decision making, um, the tools from the test evaluation community give us, give us more, um, because what we're talking about when we go from assurance cases to more, more complexity really is a, a greater understanding of precise understanding of risk. And so this, I think, we will get from the TNE and DMV community. So we'll be able to, I think, start with assurance cases using the industry experience that's there and then evolve over time as we get more and more precise understanding of risk. 
with the tools that will come out to you in the DMV. So I, I think there's a path. So Lauren, hearing that, uh, are you know, you know, with those types of defense assurance cases, you know, being built and in process of being built, would that uh, is that enough of a demand signal for the industry partners that you work with, for the investment professionals you work with? Uh, what would what would you think uh, then hearing that? Would they would it be a positive reaction? Would they want more? I'm curious as well. I think it's specific enough that it helps inform that community, but as many examples that we can give as possible would be helpful and in, in certain environments as much detail as possible as well. But I think what I find exciting about this is we, we talked about that increasing appetite to work with the Department of Defense, but also this evolving defense industrial base where you have consolidation with a lot of the primes. So it's very defined. You know who those providers are. They know how the government works. They know how to follow rules. But now with all these non-traditionals, when you talk about almost that certification process, it helps me think through how we kind of put parameters around this redefining of the defense industrial base where we're thinking about the security of the technologies and almost providing that certification like that energy star of, okay, this is trustworthy. Here's a list that you can use, which is almost providing a marketplace, which I think is really interesting too, as we think about the evolving nature of the defense industrial base on the private sector side, but helping to inform security. So it's two ways, it's providing this marketplace, but also guidance around research and development from the private sector side, which is great. But I think the example of assurance is a helpful one. And I'm glad to hear you're thinking that way as well, because we should look to industry and say, you know, across the sectors where we have made the most significant advancements, how can we replicate that on the defense side instead of trying to start from scratch with our own defense application? So I think that demand signal is a good one. And there's, of course, tons of capital going towards um, vehicles and, and companies like Tesla and others. And so how can we leverage that from a defense perspective instead of trying to, to start from scratch and fund things like this um, from start? And companies like Tesla are glad to help too or have these conversations yeah. as well. I mean, on the, the I like the, the analogy used for the energy star. Uh, and as someone who is very uh, crazy about keeping their AC tech at <laughs> 72 or 73 degrees every single day, uh, I, you know, I, I empathize with that, that and knowing that, you know, my AC is energy efficient or my fridge is energy efficient or whatever. Uh, it almost ties back to Dr. Rick, I think what you're saying about, you know, quantifiable metrics. Uh, do you almost envision that those metrics could become called the energy star of the trusted autonomy space that if I'm going to make something up, like if a system hits, you know, nine out of the 10 metrics, it's, it qualifies for the autonomy star <laughs> certification kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, um, and interesting that you mentioned, um, uh, I, I brought up Tesla, but we, I, along with my boss, went out to Silicon Valley and, and visited some companies. They were one that we visited. It was a great exchange, understanding what they're doing around Shadow Movie Eye. And uh, to your point, Kedar, about uh, quantifiable metrics. So, you know, really, these, these metrics are intended to be uh, sort of in use monitors, right? So, so in use, and there is a, a group at Purdue, uh, you know the folks well, um, Mira Jane in her lab, she's one of, the, one of the first folks that I encountered doing this research in bi-directional. Now, there are plenty of people doing this research, so I you know, don't wanna leave anyone out, but, but what they're doing there, I call human aware robotics. They have a much more sophisticated name for it. Um, but they have done some, some testing and measurement of some parameters in very controlled environments and then pivoted to, to real cases uh, where they're monitoring those, uh, those parameters and they set thresholds. And so when those parameters move outside of certain thresholds, the robot changes its behavior toward the human being to bring those, those parameters back within the threshold, right? And so when we think about what these metrics create, they create opportunities really around designing how we want to uh, move within a mission. Uh, how we expect humans to behave within a mission, right? Um, and, and there's not simply one set. I've, I've talked about quantifiable metrics in audiences before and had people come to me and say, well, tell me what they, what, what are the metrics you're looking for? You know, it will be mission specific, system specific. Right now, um, Aerospace Corporation is running a uh, technology demonstration for, for the Optima initiative uh, in which they have um, 
a trusted AI framework, they call it. And within that framework, they have some characteristics. And so I asked, that's, can these characteristics be quantified in metrics? And so we think so. So right now in their tech demonstration, they are validating those characteristics as quantifiable metrics that you can track, right? To actually ensure that you have trusted behavior. And so this is uh, a, a, a demonstration that they're running is around space somehow, right? And so we're talking about, you know, a sort of a, a space that was not on my radar during autonomy for space, but one that would be very critical going forward. So this is a, an early instantiation of uh, uh, quantifiable metrics uh, for uh, space autonomy. Um, so when we think about, you know, you know, I like this notion of a gold star, but I want to shy away a bit from saying, hey, we're going to certify, because what that's, I think, the way people think thought about this problem. We're going to certify it as trustworthy and it's going to go off. Yeah. But in all of the, you know, the, the seminal documents, where there's the Defense Science Board Summer Study, the Air Force uh, Scientific Advisory Board study that they did on unintended behavior of, uh, of, of uncrewed systems, uh, there is this continuous theme that in complex and tested environments, um, uncertainty, um, um, levels of trustworthiness will vary, mm -hmm. you know, in operation. And so um, we have to have you know, an approach that takes that into account. So, I mean, and that I think uh, tracks a lot. I mean, the battlefield environment is inherently, you know, fog of war and uncertainty is just in, going to be there. And even for a Tesla operating and dropping uh, you're driving on a simple highway, it still faces uncertainty, even though it may not be at the levels of uh, what you see, you know, in a more wartime situation. So, but even, let me actually ask you, Dr. Riddick, you know, the stuff that has been currently worked on from a quant quantitative perspective, from a metrics perspective, could that be used by industry as a starting point just to like build systems, test them out, um, and see if what's being done in the private sector is actually measuring up to what DOD would need? Yeah, you know, I think that would be a pivot for me. I've been so focused in this year on the DOD problem and ensuring that we get an understanding of the problem. Is are these notions that really are mine? Are they are they feasible? Right. Uh, I always go into meetings with folks saying, "Tell me, tell me whether or not I'm crazy." Right. Uh, and uh, so far, no one has called me crazy to my face. <laughs> But I think the pivot, though, is to dual use, right? Because this, I think, you know, and I, Lauren, I appreciated the comments that, that uh, you made on the panel of the meeting of the two, because you really were talking about adoption and scaling and making it very real for me, right? And so as, you know, I'm engaging, I think the pivot, one of the pivots to make really is toward what makes this palatable, right, to industry. And... We talk about the quote unquote the tons of money that has moved in from venture capital into this uh, autonomy space, mostly around driverless vehicle. You know, my question to venture capital is, hey, we have the undersecretary saying that trusted autonomy, trusted AI is so critical to what we want to do going forward in this very important strategic space for DOD. What would it take to in interest uh, small percentages of that venture capital money into moving into this? Uh, very critical space. Mm -hmm. It's a novel space, but there are folks who have been working in it for a while, and there are some things there that could be matured to the point of commercialization. And so we're, we're not talking about changing the entire focus of the entire venture, venture capital uh, investment, but you know, if, the, if, if rumor has it, we're talking about double digit billions, double digit billions. So 1% of that is triple digit millions, right? So we're talking about hundreds of millions of uh, dollars in investment potentially in venture capital moving into the space. How do we create the interest from the defense side to get those small percentages to move is one of the challenges I think I'm faced with. So, so pivoting now to dual use is completely appropriate, I think, um, and, and a place where I'll you know, put some thought going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my, my reaction to that, and frankly, to the program initially was, you don't want this to be seen as yet another hurdle to doing business in the defense space. And when I think about trust, I'm thinking about it more from a business perspective, 
in terms of adoption and scaling, like we talked about, and also security, which is critical to both of those. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately it's things like user experience, mm -hmm. which the worker needs to trust the insights these technologies are providing to use them. And we see that on the private sector side too. So I think from the VC community, and it's interesting because you hear a lot of VCs talk about, yes, it's the technologies, but it's the people they're investing in. Mm -hmm. And so it's this teaming essentially between the human and the machine that they're looking at to say, okay, what are the, what are the possibilities from a business perspective? DOD is a very attractive customer because DOD spends a lot of money on technology, people, services. And so from that perspective, I think the VC community is just looking for demand signals. Where are you going to be spending that money? And let's co-invest because they're happy to be part of these businesses that will be successful. They're already likely part of them. So how can we make that process more efficient so that everyone's successful and happy and ultimately serving a mission purpose? And I think that there is such passion from lots of VCs and tech companies, again, that patriotic sense where they're appreciating their ability to be, have prosperity and operate in the U.S. So how can they support the DOD in that sense? And, and so I think signals to the VC community or collaboration with the VC community helps inform their investments. And then we have to make sure they don't hear this effort as another hurdle and instead helpful guidance to ensure the adoption of these technologies or the success of these technologies. And when I talked about earlier, almost this frustration around pilots or prototypes, but not a lot of traction, mm -hmm. I think efforts like Optima are getting organized to pick winners within those pilots and prototypes and make them successful. And I'm glad you pushed back on the energy star point because you're right, it shouldn't just be a check in the box. It needs to be continuous, mm -hmm. but it's providing guidance so that companies can at least go to bat and yeah. give it a shot. Sure. And, and they need to be successful too in ensuring everything around compliance or delivery mm -hmm. when it comes to the warfighter. I'm curious if both of you have a perspective too on what can industry be doing better, one, but I do think a takeaway for me from this conversation is industry is looking at this issue as well, not necessarily from warfighter needs, but Tesla, their drivers, we need to keep them safe. If you hear about a Tesla crashing, it makes much more news than a regular car crash. Car crashes happen all the time. And so there's a lot of risk that industry is thinking through. And I think whether it's assurance or there are plenty of applications that they can help inform their their thought process is, is part of yours as well. But is there any anything industry can be doing better at providing more of to be good partners in this sense? Yeah, you know, um, so I come from the laboratory mm -hmm. and in fact, a basic research and early applied uh, research laboratory. And um, I would say at the beginning of my career, I didn't really have a lot of engagement with industry, right? Um, our idea of transition was to go from basic research into some Field it capable, right? Go out there and transition it. And um, over the time in my career, though, and in fact, I would give credit to um, you know Tom Russell when he was the director of Army Research Laboratory, started Open Campus. Mm -hmm. And when he did that, a lot of people were scratching their head, you know, because the idea here was we're not going to go out and fund people. Um, we're going to invite folks to come into the laboratory um, in uh, relationship. Right, we were using at the time creators, which are in concert. Right? Mm -hmm. And so you're not paying a, a collaborator to come and work with you. You're saying, hey, let's get together, let's form a relationship. Out of that will come opportunity. And one of the things that I discovered in that, especially with industry partners, was you know we had great capability uh, inside the laboratory. Um, our people cost is a little high, right? Um, academic partners had lots of people but not access to our capabilities. So they were in the mix. Mm -hmm. And then the industry partner being there early in the discovery phase um, as exceptional pieces of technology um, you know, would arise, moving them quickly into the industry space where you know, moving into product is their um, uh, motivation created that very interesting ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? And so to me, um, you know, I think industry partners are outstanding because they are very good at moving things quickly. And I'm all about accelerating to delivery, right? Um, so the willingness of an industry partner 
to to be in a situation like that where you know we're in exploration we're developing relationship is always very beneficial because as things come from the laboratory we can move to, the, to industry quickly the challenge there is um you know companies that have the capability to put folks on you know teams to do that are great um and that would be you know larger companies that have larger budgets mm -hmm. but even some of the larger companies that are more uh, project focused can't necessarily do that because they're, they're they're charging all their time to the project and having someone come sit with me you know who, who are you going to charge to yeah. and, so, and, a, and an income significant challenge to smaller companies right who are working and I, I say this, you know, in in the you know, not a negative way, but they're they're trying to keep the lights on, mm -hmm. right? So how do they send someone over to sit with them, right? Um, so I think in certain aspects we figure that out, but the willingness of industry to be involved um, in the discovery phase, so things can accelerate, yeah. I think it is is one place where some thought probably needs to go, mm -hmm. um, but that is. It's extraordinarily important. And then the willingness of industry to engage with folks like me who are just standing up these initiatives. Because what I want to do at, at the end of the day is to build some frameworks that allow, you know, as you said, to not be barriers, mm -hmm. right? To to understand the value proposition and then to really support the ecosystem that's required to bring these things forward, mm -hmm. right? Um, I often said to folks in the lab, we don't build the widget, right? But we have the smarts about what is needed for the warfighter. So it's a it's an ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. It's a it's something that has to be done in partnership. But um, I think industry partners have always been amazing in my experience. I, I think working with them from the, the laboratory side really helps to understand their challenges. Mm -hmm. And with that, we can start to think of how to fashion some things. But every conversation should start with money, right? The conversation really has to start with what's best for the warfighter and then how do we use the resources that we have. And I don't mean dollar resources, but resources in terms of relationship and capability to get there. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought up Creative because I've actually seen them be great tools for access to domain expertise. And then also things like DD254s, mm -hmm. which are the sponsorship to proceed to get your facilities clearance mm -hmm. or meet some clients. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I think Creative's are great tools. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of companies that are hungry for that guidance or, mm -hmm. as you said, what you have access to during exploration phase is so valuable from a, a tech development perspective too. So th those are great tools. So we actually, yeah, we have a few minutes left here. Um, I'd love to hear both of your final thoughts on, you know, the future of the space, uh, you know, what you all will be working on over the next six, 12 to six, six or 12 months mm -hmm. uh, before we meet back here next year. So yeah. Um, yeah. Lauren, I'm gonna start with you. Okay. Well, I think we're at, I, I keep kind of harping on this, that fact of the industry, I think, excitement around supporting the Department of Defense mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, at an all-time high. Um, and I think the demand on all sides to figure out collaboration is there. So I think between that and the economic outlook, frankly, where companies don't have the time and resources to waste on very long lead times, we'll start to see a little bit of, maybe it's a correction or weeding out of who the real players are. Uh, but I think DOD has to really focus on continuing to get organized so that all of these innovation hubs aren't just noise or seen as kind of a waste of time, but very productive in shepherding these companies to be successful partners. Mm -hmm. So I think the next six months to a year, again, with the economic outlook, it's going to put a lot of pressure on this process where VCs aren't going to be as interested in funding companies with a very high burn rate to to prioritize just defense and national security. But at the same time, there's a real appreciation and support for the defense and national security community. So I think it's a good thing where we're gonna put a lot of focus and pressure on getting this right. And I think efforts like Optima are, are really informing that organization. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. And um, I think we've got to kind of hit the ground running with making some of these programs successful instead of checking the box to say, we've had 20 pilots or for companies to try to fundraise off saying, we have three sivers. No, what does the future of that program look like? Who are you gonna partner with? Where is that funding coming from? Who are your champions going to be? And answering some of those questions. But I think it's an important time. Yeah. Dr. Riddick? Yeah, and, and you know, I really appreciate those comments and um, you know, the, the focus there. 
And for me, focus is really important, right? Um, I always say the focus is on the war fighter, right? And the other thing that I, I, I really, you know, have gravitated to is this notion of these quantifiable metrics, right? And, and that we have to deliver trust as a product that is a quantifiable value for us. And so, so we're getting away from sort of this being sort of notional or, or subjective, right, down to things that we can really measure. And um, I'll, I'll repeat myself here and say, I really want us to arrive at a place where we're not another mandate. I love that. But a value proposition, mm -hmm. right? And, and in the ecosystem that's going to be required to deliver this, everyone has to understand their unique value. Mm -hmm. So we're not sort of in a, you know, um, any sort of, sort of a zero sum discussion, but what is the unique value that everyone brings to this? I think as DOD, part of the unique value that we can bring to this is sort of moving the barriers, mm -hmm. right? Removing hurdles and understanding how to do that. We have to be in partnership, right? We have to understand, you know, what is it that makes it uh, feasible and for, for industry to bring these things forward. Um, the acquisition life cycle is there. And while reform is always on everyone's mind, uh, we know that in the near term, it's not going away. Um, but there is flexibility within the acquisition life cycle. It's not um, something that we should be afraid to address directly. And again, in partnership. And so I think the point that I'm at now is that I've spent a year and I think we've developed a, a lot of the, uh, the foundational work. Now it's about pivoting uh, to some of these um, uh, lab constructive testing uh, venues to say, we've got to do some discovery and validation. Um, and I will do that in a pilot and proof of concept uh, sort of setting, but the pilot's proof of concept will help us develop these research baselines off of which we'll build frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. And I hear you, Lauren, loud and clear that a framework does not say that there is a, a commitment on the other side, right? And so I need to do some work to ensure that as we build those frameworks, we identify what are those programs of record where the opportunities are. Mm -hmm. And so we can start to, you know, you know, plug in and direct the industry around where those opportunities are. But I think the framework is a good setting. Mm -hmm. I think we understand what the characteristics are that we're looking for in terms of you know, metrics, monitoring, real-time assessment, the architectures that we want built in the future um, into machine uh, intelligence and design. For the things that are in the pipeline now that were not designed with these notions at the outset, uh, we really want these frameworks to meet them where they are as they arrive in the, in the acquisition uh, process. But over time, we will have, you know, uh, you know this, uh, this type of trust and trust architecture and ethics and responsibility in the design consideration of systems going forward. Uh, but, but to your point, uh, Lauren, it needs to be very concrete so that as folks are investing and looking for other investors, they can point to where the actual opportunities are in DOD. And so that's a challenge that I'll take away from this conversation as I you know, build out the framework. How do we get more concrete so that business really has a foundation to build from? So with that, thank you, Dr. Riddick, Warren, for coming out and joining us. Uh, thank you also to our hosts at uh, Defense Scoop for having this wonderful panel here today. Uh, and thank you again to the, all those uh, tuned in and watching us. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your morning and uh, look, looking forward to working with you further.